Welcome to With All Due Respect. This is a podcast for women over 40 who are looking for sane, frank advice about their health and wellness, especially through and after menopause. I'm Amanda Thieb, a personal trainer and nutrition coach and the author of the best-selling book, Menopocalypse, how I learned to thrive during menopause and how you can too. I'd love you to join me every week as I chew the fat with some fab guests on hot topics that directly impact you. I also know the power of conversation is lost and there's nothing better than sitting down for a natter with your mate and putting the world to rights. And that's exactly what I'll be doing with this podcast. We'll really get to know my guests, what's and all. I've made it my mission to help you by exploding a few myths and presenting you with plain, simple facts. These inspiring conversations will hopefully empower you to be a healthy, strong, resilient bitch, you know, just like me. Before we get started, don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a review and then visit me at amandatheeb.com. And now let's get started on today's show. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to this week's episode of With All Due Respect with me, Amanda Thieb. Today, I am excited to have two guests on the show. I have Dr. Mandy Leonhardt and Dr. Hannah Short, who are the authors of the book, The Complete Guide to POI and Early Menopause. Dr. Short is a G. He specialist in menopause and we got connected a couple of years ago and have kept in contact because I love Hannah's work to do with POI and premenstrual disorders. And Hannah has a particular interest in induced menopause and premature ovarian insufficiency, which is POI. And we'll dig into that a little bit more. And having undergone a hysterectomy and ovarian removal at the age of 35. And so that drives her passion. And so she collaborated with Dr. Mandy Leonhardt, who is also a GP with a menopause specialist based in Hampshire, which by the way, is my family town. We'll talk about that in Romsey. That's where my family are all from. Mandy, brilliant name, by the way, is Certified nutritionist with MNU and also certified ISGE practitioner, which is the International Society for Gynecological Endocrinology. Mandy has a particular interest in women's hormonal health, lifestyle medicine, and nutrition. And so thank you both for coming onto the show today. Welcome. Thank you, Amanda. So I hope that introduction did you proud. I've had to like condense all of your massive experience and knowledge into just a few sentences. But it's because I want to spend the rest of the time really trying to understand why you wrote a book about POI and early menopause, why you thought it was important and what like drove the passion to get there. So do you want to start with this, Mandy? And we'll, we'll mm-hmm. sort of get stuck in. Thank you. Well, so Hannah and me originally met on Twitter where we connected and it soon was clear that we both had a passion about raising awareness on menopause in general. And we were both really pleased to see that menopause, particularly in the UK, has become a, has become a talking point and there has been a real increase in awareness over the last few years. And you, you, We'll have been aware of that as well, Amanda. I don't know what it's like in um, in North America, but certainly in the UK, we were really pleased that uh, menopause has become a, a hot topic. It's, uh, you know, with regards to menopause support in the workplace and women in general are more open to seek help and talk about it. But what we have noticed is that there's a particular group of women that feel in- excluded because it's generally the, the, the natural age of menopause, which is on average 51, that is... Uh, gets a lot of the uh, the attention and gets talked about the most. But in our clinics, so we both have very busy clinics, we also see women with other types of menopause, much younger women, women who have a surgical menopause, so have their ovaries removed for particular reasons through op- an operation, who are have over on menopause because they had cancer treatment or who are on menopause for any other treatment or and then there is a group of women who have a condition called premature which is a condition where ovaries just do not work properly uh, below the age of 40 you know any time from puberty so we found that these women were often not part of the discussion and we wanted to include them and wanted to give them a platform 
and support because we cannot see all women in our clinic as much as we would like to see as many women as we can. We have limits as to how many patients we can see. So Hannah, with her personal experience and also with me, with my clinical experience with patients, we found that this group of, of women and are much more challenging sometimes to treat because they're much younger. There is There are issues around fertility, which can be extremely stressful for, for some women. And they're, they're often not, yeah, they're often being dismissed and ignored by the medical profession. And that's why we felt, you know what, we need to put something out there that helps them. And we have done some research and we found really nothing that was updated and inclusive and very comprehensive that covers all, all the things we are passionate about, lifestyle, medical treatments, options, so that women can make an informed choice about their future. And that's how we slowly but surely um, uh, realized uh, maybe we should write a book together and maybe we can support each other through this because on, on my own, I would not have done this. And But thankfully, Hannah, Hannah was the most amazing co-author I could have wished for. And we did it. And we we hope that this book is a support tool for those women who are affected by this, these conditions. And but maybe also those people who look after these women, the parents, carers, guardians, husbands, wives. And that's the bottom line. Yeah, I mean, the book is huge as well. There's so much valid information in there. I absolutely loved it. And there's clearly a crossover to perimenopause as well. And and, and the advice you give and the, the research that you've done. Dr. Hannah, do you want to sort of like jump in now and sort of talk about what led you here? Because that Clearly, it comes from a personal experience. And I know you've been quite open with your struggles. That's actually how I found you and have really valued sort of you being vulnerable about this as a medical professional. Yeah, thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, part of the main reason I, I, I've ended up working in this area, I think, is you know, through my own personal experience, because I was always interested in women's health when I was doing my medical training before I had surgery at 35, which resulted in my ovaries being removed and having a hysterectomy and, and putting me in a premature surgical menopause. But I hadn't really appreciated the impact that that would have on me. And the reason I ended up having the surgery was because I was struggling with I had endometriosis and I had severe premenstrual symptoms and I kind of exhausted all the other treatment options. And without going into the whole thing, because it was a kind of a long story, but it had been over 20 years. I mean, since puberty that I had struggled and reached the end of the line. And for me, it felt like a positive step to enter an early surgical menopause because it was the whole idea was to improve my my quality of life and although it's certainly done that I have a better quality of life compared to what I did um, earlier it, it was a bit of a shock I, I think I naively thought you remove the ovaries I'm lucky in that I didn't have a malignant condition so I could have HRT for example for symptoms and to protect my bones and heart and everything like that but I simply thought I'll just add the hormones back in and I'll just get on with things and it's a bit naive I realized but I was under the care of a very good gynecologist who was compassionate and knowledgeable and yet I still found myself struggling so that's nine years ago now and I think it really really opened my eyes to the fact, you know, everything that Mandy alluded to, that that this group of women, myself included, just sort of hugely underserved. And I did think if I struggle as a medical professional with access to good care, what what the hell do others do? I mean, I, I, I actually joined forces with a nurse who went through a similar thing. She was a couple of years, two or three years older than me, I think, at the time. And we did an awareness campaign called Change the Change. And we wrote about it in the national press. And it was a big NH day, NHS Change Day campaign, which is something we have in the UK or did used to have. And it was kind of just raising awareness of stuff online, of, of things in health that we, need, we needed to improve. And that kind of kick-started it all. And I got involved with the British Menopause Society and and, and that just things took off from there, really. And I and I just then started focusing my training on on that alongside general practice. And I guess the ultimately we read we wrote the book for the reasons Mandy said, but I think I wanted to help write the book that I wish was there because you, and you know it, it's you can be told one thing, you know, be about the medical treatment, but then you're not told about the diet and lifestyle stuff, which is just as important. Or like nobody really talked about the fertility aspect or the psychological impacts or the impacts on your sexual health and well-being. And so that we tried to do it all. And I'm I, like, yeah, I'm very grateful that 
the Monday did it with me because I, I I would have struggled to do this. And I think she, she's a very forgiving co-author because I think I'm a bit of a bit of a micromanager, but we managed to pull it off. <laughs> yeah, I mean the dynamic of writing a book with someone I can only imagine, right? So I mean. But that, that was the sort of why I wrote my book as well. I was like, I want a book that somebody should have given me. And that, and I love that you've done this. I think it's uh, such a great resource. I actually have a menopause resource sheet that I give out when I do talks and on my website. And it's included in there because I haven't seen a book like it. So I'm really happy that you you know, you got through all of that working as a couple, your book wife, and, and it worked out. So let's just move on a bit because... I want to talk specifically about the premature ovarian insufficiency because, I mean, I'm aware of it. I don't know enough about it. I was under the impression it impacted women under the age of 40, about one in 10. And I know you're going to correct me on that. And I also get that it's been dismissed and ignored because regular menopause is, perimenopause is dismissed and ignored. So I'd like you to sort of like if you could, between you, tell me sort of like what it is, like what the definition is. When you say under the age of 40, I mean, does it affect people in their 20s? I mean, what's the sort of age range? Why do you think it's being dismissed and ignored? I'm assuming it's because it's just that lack of valid data that's there and it was missed in medical school again, like another thing that's dismissed. Yeah, so like what is... Well, so yeah, P- premature ovarian insufficiency or POI is, is probably the preferred term now for a decline in ovarian function or a premature menopause below the age of 40. And this can affect anybody born with ovaries. So you know, girls, women or trans, sorry, trans masculine, non-binary people who are under the age of 40, but any, any age from, from puberty upwards. Um, and it can present in very different ways. So in my case, for example, I had my ovaries removed. And so that's very much a premature kind of menopause, which in menopause, this is where some of the confusion can come. There's a lot of different terminology. So menopause refers to a permanent state. POI is more, a, a can be more of a fluctuating state. So there's a decline in the ovarian function. So the ovaries obviously normally will produce regular amounts of estrogen and progesterone throughout the menstrual cycle as an, an ovulation and eggs produced ready to repair you know the lining of the uterus for pregnancy and if that doesn't occur then you obviously shed the lining of your womb and this in theory if you're healthy and you have regular menstrual cycles this should occur this you notice we women and girls with POI will probably have irregular periods or they may stop or they may never have started and I think that's where the term POI probably is more relevant but just to make things confusing POI now covers the, the chemical, the certain, no, not sorry, the chemical, the medical menopause, the surgical menopause, and it's basically a loss of ovarian hormones under the age of forty from whatever cause. But it can affect any, anybody born with ovaries from the from puberty upward. I don't, I don't know, Mandy. You probably want to I may make something more more eloquent description, but no, no, you're perfectly correct. And with regards to numbers. The, the sad truth is that we don't really have a clear idea about numbers and incidents. So some statistics say it's it's one in a hundred women under the age of forty, but there are certain certain studies that show that it can be three percent of women under forty, or even in some countries up to ten, fifteen percent, even up to twenty percent. With, with so we're talking about POIs, the premature ovarian insufficiency, and where we we don't where we see a decline in ovarian function and the lack of estrogen and progesterone um, in in those women where we don't necessarily know a cause. So obviously, those women who had surgery or who had chemotherapy or radiotherapy, they know or they will hopefully be told beforehand, before they undergo the treatment, that it may affect the way their ovaries work. But we also see women where who, who have had no clear reason or identifiable cause who just skip periods or never had a period, as Hannah said, you know, do not go through a normal puberty or went through a normal puberty. And then only a few years later, suddenly, or not suddenly, they have fewer and fewer periods and uh, and they stop altogether. And they obviously need to be investigated. But we know that there are many, many causes for this. And one of the cause, so in terms of statistics, we know that in countries with higher levels of pollution, like India, for example, there are statistics that where, where we know that up to 20% of, of younger women may be affected by ovarian dysfunction because of the environment they live in. So it is 
you know, some of the studies we have come from, from Western countries, from Europe, and then we would say the statistic is probably around 3% of women. So uh, to be truthful, we do not count all the women that are affected. They are not all collected. We need a better way of, of statistically reaching out to these women and, and counting them so that we actually know the extent of the way um, this, this part of the population is, is affected. And that's, that's really urgently needed. That makes sense to me now because when you say it's because of many causes and the different categories it falls under, it sort of like makes sense. And why why wouldn't we do it that way as well? Because we know it's the under the age of 40 component that makes it more important as far as like the treatment options and the preventative aspect of of the the problems that they've got, which we'll go into into a minute. I really want to dig deep into that. But can you just sort of finish this little part saying why you think this doesn't get the attention? Like why don't doctors know about this? What do we think? I I think it's lack of awareness in, in many cases. I mean, I I, I can't speak for, for Mandy because we've obviously we've trained at different medical schools in different countries, but I, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if she'd had a lot of training because I, I know that generally doctors of our generation didn't get good menopause training at all. And and the, the only thing that I, you know, if you think about you know, investigating irregular periods, I don't really remember being taught about kind of, you know, very early premature menopause. It, so it wasn't called POI, it probably was called premature ovarian failure, but we've moved away from that term now. But but uh, there's just that there was a lack of training and awareness. And there are so many reasons why periods can change in women. And I think often it's put down to things like stress or then maybe, you know, thinking is it something like polycystic ovarian syndrome or is it because you know they're exercising too much or under eating so there's so many reasons why you can get changes to your menstrual cycle I mean so many women that I've seen in clinic have been told for years oh you're you know you're just busy and stressed that's why you've skipped a period or you're not eating enough or you know maybe you ex- you know you do you're a marathon runner it's probably because of that even if they're not underweight and I think it you know so women are told that they go away they think okay but you know, maybe then they come to a point when they think maybe they'd like to try for a baby, for example, and they haven't had regular periods for years. And it, often people are given the diagnosis in fertility clinics, which is just heartbreaking for them. But I think it has just been like, it, it's generally just lack of awareness. Um, and and, pay, and even doctors now will still say to patients, oh, you're too young for this, this can't possibly be menopause. Uh, which yeah, I, I hear that all the time. Uh, yeah, it's Actually, because of people like you that when people say, I think this could be um, menopause, I'm like, well, then at least look into it. If you're having all of these problems, don't ignore it because there's concerns if you do go into menopause under the age of 40, right? So Mandy, would you like to sort of like talk a little bit about the challenges of early menopause, POI, that type of thing, you know, under that age and you know, why it's really important to be proactive as a woman. Absolutely. So you, our body is a, is a really complex um, setup, you know, and part of the machinery that keeps everything going um, and very importantly are hormones. Hormones play an important role for our well-being and there are many different cl- glands in our body, thyroid gland, adrenal gland, um, and ovaries are just another gland, but they also happen to carry our eggs that help us to be reproductive, to be able to have babies. But they are an important part of the body because they make important hormones, including estrogen, progesterone, but also testosterone and, and other hormones that I, I'm not going to mention now. But when we enter puberty, so when when a, when a, a girl matures and she's ready to to enter the stage of puberty, ovaries become much more active. They make more estrogen. And why is it important to have estrogen during that time? Mainly not. So there are many, many reasons why we need estrogen, because one of the reasons is that we go through a normal pubertal development to that it, estrogen helps our brain to mature and to grow. It helps. It's also a neurotransmitter in the brain. So it helps to make new nerve connections. It also increases, helps with our mood. It gives our body energy. It importantly helps to increase bone mineral density. So it consolidates both the, the strength of our bones. And we really only have up till the age of 25 to 
to get our bone density up and running because up till that age, our bones grow, we grow up <laughs> and our bones um, become stronger. And from the age of 25, bone and mineral density doesn't really increase anymore. It doesn't really change. So it's important that we pay attention to girls going through an or you know, females to go through a normal puberty to have the sexual development, you know, the breast growth, but also the bone strength. And that we don't miss that because you can't get that back. It is really difficult to reverse something. Once you have, for example, osteoporosis, it's much harder to reverse that condition, uh, reverse this condition compared to diagnosing someone early with lack of estrogen and, and POI and, and replacing these hormones early on so that they continue to thrive and have a normal development. But with normal, I mean in medical terms, normal is a preventative. And because we know that, for example, in women who, who go through an early menopause, they have an increased risk of osteoporosis. And it happens quite quickly. Within, It can sometimes happen within a few years. And that is something which is really important to prevent because it can lead to an increased risk of fractures and disability and, and pain. And, you know, it's it's something that is incredibly difficult to, to then treat once it's, it's, it's severe. But so that's why when a woman enters menopause at the natural age, that would be 51, of course, she will also be at risk of osteoporosis, depending on her, her background, her medical history, the medication she may have taken. But the risk start, starts ideally much later. And you can still do an awful lot to prevent having osteoporosis by the time you're 80. But let's say you lose these important hormones by the time you're 20 or much younger or, or before the age of 51, then that means that your risks get moved forward in terms of years. They start much, much sooner to happen. Another important reason why we, we need estrogen, for example, is cardiovascular health. Estrogen keeps our blood vessels elastic and supple and a lack of estrogen that we know that from studies can lead to the hardening and stiffening of, of arteries and potentially increase the risk of stroke and, and heart disease. We also know that women who lose estrogen too soon and too early have an increased risk of dementia if it's not addressed. So we need these hormones for our brain health, for, for our bone health, for our ca cardiovascular health, for our mood and general functioning. And I haven't even talked about the symptoms you may experience, right? So I'm just talking about the function that these hormones have. But the symptoms are much more complex because they are so individual that there may be women who have very severe symptoms and others who have no symptoms or don't notice even that they haven't got estrogen because they don't know any different. That's why we, we can't always say, oh, you know what, if you've got a hot flush, you could be menopause, see a doctor. But what about the woman who does never have a hot flush? She could still have POI despite never having a hot flush. So it is not as simple as to raise awareness just based on based on the on the symptoms they may experience, because there is a multitude of symptoms. To cut this short, and to we we basically every single cell in our body has estrogen receptors, and every single cell particularly mitochondria, which are the energy, the powerhouse of our cells, require estrogen to function better. That does not mean that a woman who's over 50 cannot go through a menopause transition in a healthy way and live without estrogen. But it is not ideal for anyone under the age of 45 to, because it accelerates, lack of estrogen accelerates the aging process quite rapidly. Um, and to slow it down, Picking, it, uh, diagnosing it early and treating it and being aware of the risks, so, you know, being aware of the heart health, being aware of the brain health and the bone health is, is therefore really uh, important. Right. Um, I don't know, so, you, you know all about menopause symptoms, Amanda. <laughs> So um, we can talk I more do. about the symptoms, but they are, they're different often in women who are younger and they're not always so typical, let's put it that way. And so those three risk factors are, are so important if we're talking about quality of life and longevity. Yep. We know we know that this really matters. Dr. Hannah, how and when, how would a woman know she ha was in a state of POI or when should she go to a doctor to try and seek out a diagnosis? Because I feel like that might be a, quite a tricky thing to do, but I know that it's something that you're quite clear about a woman doing in your book. Well, again, it's... It, 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 I suppose the general thing is to to monitor changes in periods. So any woman 
under 45, but specifically under 40, because early menopause is actually relating to women between 40 and 45, and that's a little subgroup. But uh, but still, women need to be aware that if their periods stop between that age, they do need to take steps to protect their health. And the same things really apply for PO, as they do for POI, but perhaps it's not quite as drastic. But essentially, any women under 45 who's starting to have very irregular periods, especially over a four-month period or their periods stop, should really kind of seek you know medical help just to to check. There are some easy blood tests that the GP can do just to rule out other causes. So looking at thyroid function, for example, checking an FSH level. So that's follicle stimulating hormone. And we don't generally do this if women are over 45, because most women over 45 are in perimenopause. The FSH is known to go up and down in perimenopause. That's expected. And it doesn't change anything. So we can expect a woman over 45 to be perimenopausal. If she's otherwise well and we're not concerned of missing any of the diagnosis, we don't need to check that. But under 45 and certainly under 40, we need to rule out other things. So if the FSH is normal, we'd be looking at something else. Is it the thyroid problem that's causing irregular periods? Has this uh, patient got polycystic ovarian syndrome? So that's where you check things like testosterone levels and the ratio between luteinizing hormone and SSH. But, you know, there's, there's lots of other the things we kind of look at but the way that you would go is is, is, it's basically four months of having a change in your period or no periods at all would be regardless of whether you have any other symptoms you should see your job you know your family doctor your gp to kind of get some baseline tests and to get a diagnosis of of poi you need two raised fsh levels four to six weeks apart that's the main thing and you know there's some other tests you can kind of look at but that's that's the kind of baseline those girls who haven't started their periods, though, they're the other thing. So if by 15, 16, you've never had a period, then you should go to your doctor because the age at which girls start their periods is now much earlier than it used to be. But most women and girls should have started by 16. There will be a few and they won't necessarily have POI who might start later, but 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 uh, and it, they may still have a normal kind of reproductive life. But yeah, if you've never started your periods and you're kind of halfway through your teens, it would be good to get that checked out as well. And then in that situation, when you go to your doctor who isn't informed, is there a particular specialist they should be referred to, like an endocrinologist or a gynecologist? Who is the ideal sort of person to be having this discussion with? So in the UK, we've got nice guidelines on irregular... They're not just nice, are they? They're the NICE stands for something. It's an acronym. Sorry. They are nice, but they're... (laughs) National (laughs) Institute of Clinical Excellence. But um, these guidelines, they're what we would go to, because obviously as a doctor, you can't keep all the guidelines and recommendations in your head. And it's just natural that as general practitioners, for example, that you have areas which you're more drawn to that you may be naturally better at dealing with. But for example, we've got guidelines on managing diabetes, asthma, everything else. So there's nice guidelines on menopause, but there's also ones on changes to periods. So as amenorrhea, which there's no periods, and oligomenorrhea when you get irregular periods. And if a girl or woman presents with no, you know, changes to their periods over four months, what it depends on the results of the test, who you would go and see. And it also it would, to some extent, depend on the age of the patient. So certainly if it's a teenage girl and it's suggested that it might be POI, so it's not obvious, there's no obvious thyroid problem, it's not polycystic ovarian syndrome, then ideally a, a you know, either a reproductive endocrinologist or a paediatric gynecologist. Women in their 20s, 30s, it it really depends because unfortunately not all gynecologists are experts in this area, not all endocrinologists are experts in this area, not all GPs are. So you really need to find somebody with an interest in reproductive endocrinology essentially, but that can be quite hard. And yeah, it's not it's not necessarily a straightforward thing. It will be different in different countries, but that's what you're looking for. But certainly in the UK, it's hard for us to say an endocrinologist is the person to see or the you know the the gynecologist because it very much depends on that particular person in your area. It's a bit of a postcode lottery. But well, it's not much different over here in fairness. I mean, like you say, doctors have got their like leanings and their and their areas of expertise and so yeah it's I think that I I always like to say to women at least try and be as educated as you can when you're going to the doctors for a conversation because then you can have like valid like discourse with them right without being dismissed let's move on to treatments so in North America we refer to um the medication of hormones that a woman takes after the age of 45 is menopause hormone therapy 
I know in the UK it's still called hormone replacement therapy, but for a woman who is going through early menopause, I know that it's actually a, a replacement of her hormones that she needs, right? That's essentially a situation where we're not just like giving hormones to help with symptom management. We're actually trying to protect the women from the three areas that Mandy was talking about, cardiovascular, bone health, and brain health as well. So can we talk a little bit about what treatment options look like for women? And are they always hormonal in nature? Mandy, do you want to jump in? Yes. Yes, so it is the, so once you once the patient has received a diagnosis of POI or early menopause and they have no contraindications to taking hormones to replace the hormones they are no longer making themselves, we would ideally uh, discuss hormonal options with them because they really treat the underlying cause. It's a bit like having diabetes and you no longer no longer make insulin, you replace the insulin. Or so I'm talking about type one, or if you've got a thyroid problem, a hypothyroidism, you just take thyroxine and you it, it helps with preventing future problems and um, also with the symptoms you have that the, that the condition causes. So if you have no contraindication at all to taking hormones, then we would we would say this is the first line treatment because because they treat the underlying cause and. In terms of options, there are so many options now that we have available to to give women these hormones back. And the first line would, in the, at least it is internationally agreed, that giving estrogen through the skin is the first line treatment. So you try something like this first. And women with a womb, or so if, if the patient has a womb, a uterus, they need uh, to protect the lining of their womb from the effects of estrogen. So we need to give them progesterone and estrogen, or they can have uh, something like a hormone coil, a progestin-containing coil that they that gets inserted, and then they can use estrogen alongside this. And ideally, we try transdermal estrogen first because it has many advantages. You can start low and go slow. You can allow, this allows the patient to find the individual dose because it is so hugely inter-individual, the, the difference between how people, women respond to, to the hormone replacement. So we need to, we cannot ever assume that there is a one fits all. We need to individualize the treatment, the hormonal treatment. And this means that we offer a small dose, start with that, and then take, review the response and then increase it slowly to a level where she achieves the satisfying and the quality of life, but also where we are assured that there is enough bone protection and, and protection for the cardiovascular. And this is very individual. Sometimes women do get side effects and we cannot push them up and up and up, even if we as clinicians would like to. We have to go along with the way she responds. And if she tells us she gets terrible breast tenderness or she's bleeding or she feels bloated or she, she just does not tolerate this this amount of estrogen that we would like her to have, then we have to scale it back a little bit. So it is sometimes a journey that the patient has to do with the clinician. And there is no quick, we have to sometimes try different things. We have to try a patch or a gel or a spray. Or, or if that doesn't work, we have to sometimes go in along with a tablet. And there's nothing wrong if she, unless she has a blood clot problem, to, to give, give her a tablet, an estrogen tablet. So we mustn't vilify or talk badly about any treatment because what works for one woman may not work for the next. And of course, there are medical clinical reasons as to why someone cannot have an oral estrogen tablet, for example, blood clot risk or clotting disorder. But it can be an option. And if that all fails, then we can even look at things like implants, hormonal implants. These are small pellets that are then pushed into the, the, the fatty layer of the abdominal skin. And they are being released slowly into the bloodstream over time, usually several months. So this is another option that women have. What we have to do is when we when we see or any clinician who who um, who works with with these patients is that we give them options. We need to ask them what works for you, what can you incorporate in your day to day life, what makes you take this this treatment that is so important in a reliable fashion. There's no point giving a woman a gel that she hates and she'll never apply it. Uh, equally, there's no point giving a woman a patch that she can't remember applying twice a week because it's a random routine for her. So uh, that's what I do. So I ask the woman, what is important to you? Look at these are the options. 
I will show you how it works. You tell me what you're most likely to use in your day-to-day life. If it is a pill and she has no contraindication, a tablet, then I, she'll have a tablet, you know, because what I want as a clinician is her to take the treatment and to have a go at it. And then I can tweak it. as. But there are, depending on the age, there are also women who may prefer and girls to take the contraceptive pill and you know in in the north america you call birth control pill so Mm -hmm. whilst this is not really our first choice if it is the patient's choice it is a completely acceptable option because the birth control pill contains estrogen it is often a um, man-made type of estrogen which we call non-body identical so it is but it is a perfectly Um, feasible option because it may well be that the 17 year old girl teenager who has been diagnosed with POI does not wish to go on on something that she thinks her grandmother is taking you know menopausal hormone therapy she may not identify with that idea that she's menopausal so she may want to be like all her peers you may want to go on the birth control pill because a friend is taking that and also she may want to have which will be something this is something that she will then experience based on the pill she takes. So if that is important to her, I have to listen as a clinician. We have to work with our patients. I also have patients with POI who ideally should be on estrogen and they just do not tolerate it. And we have to admit, okay, this is not working for you. And then there are those women, of course, we mustn't forget, who cannot take hormonal treatment at all because they have contraindications. They may have a hormone receptive cancer and they really cannot take that. And then we have to look at other options. There are medical options to treat symptoms. So hot flushes, sleep, muscle aches and pains. We can treat the individual symptoms with other medication, but this is just symptomatic treatment. This is not preventative. So these treatments sadly do not, they increase quality of life. They can help with symptoms and but they will not prevent certain conditions. And that is where the last pillar of of health comes in. And that is healthy lifestyle and nutrition. And that you know all about a, that. <laughs> that was such a great segue, Mandy. I was like, but there is something they can do. So yeah. Hannah, let's talk about that. So we actually have to make this sort of like the last thing we discussed, but it's been so informative. Like we know what what is going on now. We know that there are valid treatment options out there, but it's always really great to put so much of the control back to the person who is struggling, right? And we can do that with lifestyle options that often don't feel like they're working in the moment, but we know the long-term outcomes of constantly being on top of our, you know, healthy behavioral habits. So what is some of your top recommendations, Hannah, for the for women in this category? Well, j- just to take the kind of re- these recommendations kind of seriously and, and and realize that what you put in your body and how you move your body will have a really profound impact on how you experience symptoms, maybe even how well your body tolerates the medication you may be taking, and also reducing your long term health risks. So, um, in terms of the recommendations, I mean, we've in in our book, we've obviously got a whole big section on this, and there's so much to kind of cover. But essentially, in dietary recommendations, it's it's a tricky one because it's opening a can of worms when you kind of go down that route. But the general the general thing is, there's no menopause diets, but there are dietary patterns that you should follow, and that's a a diet that's rich in in fiber and plant-based food so you don't need to follow an exclusively vegetarian or vegan diet but you should have an abundance of fruits and vegetables and whole grains legumes you know beans nuts and seeds in your diet um and um, and that's because it's a largely anti-inflammatory diet pattern that reduces your risk of long-term health problems such as cardiovascular disease it can improve bone health and things like that um can help in terms of mental well-being because of the the impact on the gut microbiome and that's a whole other thing we could kind of go into but and it's really antioxidant rich because a lot of people get caught up in the whole you know protein carbs fat debate and obviously some of that's important you need to have adequate of all of those but you know like a low we don't advise a very low fat diet because you need kind of some healthy fats in your diet for good hormonal functioning you need complex carbohydrates in your diet and you need protein in your diet you know you, we need all of these things but people often forget the micronutrient but things like you know iodine and the folate lot the b vitamins magnesium things like that so if you have a really varied plant-rich diet that's going to help you um 
So, you know, minimising things like processed food. Some people will find they're very sensitive to caffeine and that can exacerbate their symptoms. Others will be fine with it. it gets, to some extent, it's individual. I suppose it's like no excesses. Like alcohol, a lot of women can't tolerate alcohol in, in natural menopause, but and certainly a lot of women on on HRT will find that they they have more side effects with their medication if they have regular alcohol. A lot of people can't tolerate it. And that can have a negative impact on bone health and heart health and brain health as well. But I think some people will be able to tolerate small glass, you know, the occasional glass of wine with they're having it with food and things like that. So it's not about kind of cutting you know, some people uh, one girl actually said to me she said I already feel like my life is limited because I've been diagnosed with this condition and now I can't even have a glass of wine when I go out or I can't eat a donut and that's not what we're saying but it's about what you do most of the time you know have healthy habits there and you can enjoy yourself and you you know it's 80 percent of the time that's what's important so it's kind of building that into your routine there is there should be room for enjoyment in terms of food and stuff but obviously if you drink a bottle of wine at night that's detrimental to your health in, in so many yeah. ways not just relating to poi and exercise i think for me on a personal level that's the thing that's made the biggest difference to me i used to think it was all about my hrt and then if i wasn't feeling so well I would think oh my HRT is just not working and then I start to get a bit confused a couple of years in because I'm like well sometimes when I do this my levels are okay and then I look back and think well I've been quite stressed and actually I haven't been for a run or I haven't really done any exercise or I have been eating quite badly recently because I'm just tired and can't be bothered to cook you know that kind of thing but exercise for me I think it's because it's naturally almost like an antidepressant isn't it and it's also so important for your heart health, for your bone health, doing weight bearing exercise and, and strength training, which is something I still need to get better at. But that's one of the most positive things that you could do. And obviously that's your area of expertise. And but you know, there's so much more research coming out there. And it can be incredibly beneficial for women who can't take hormones because if you increase your, your muscle strength, they can produce myokines, say like hormone-like molecules, which can have similar effects in the brain and body to hormones and can reduce things like the hot flushes as well. So and for me, I found regular exercise really helped my energy levels, which really dipped with surgical menopause. But it is a vicious cycle. So it's kind of finding an, you know, an activity you enjoy and building up slowly if you don't have a regular exercise base. But then stress management comes into it as well. But that's going to look different for different people. We can tell everyone to meditate, but that's not going to work for everyone. No, um, it looks different work. for everyone, of course. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We, we, I mean, there's more we could say, but it, it's, it's... No, but they're the three big rocks that I, like, you know, harp on about. And it does look different to everyone. And it's really important that I think that women have, like, the flexibility and the adaptability with their choices, like not not one size fits all, you know. And so that's the problem with the world we live in. We see so much information that says, cut out this, restrict that, don't eat that. And it doesn't serve anybody in the long term because it's really hard to have sustainability when you've got so many rules, you know, being thrown at you. So listen, as we like tie all this together and we come to the end, I'm going to give you both a quick two minutes to give us some words of advice, like like just give some sort of like a life lesson that maybe you've learned from writing the book and some sage, sage wisdom because, you know, women are, are desperate to be heard and validated because we haven't been, especially in this area. So thankfully your book has addressed that. But yeah, leave us with some parting wisdom. You go, man. <laughs> Thank you to put me on the spot. I know. <laughs> well, there is, so the wisdom is that no one really has a 100% solution for any problem in the world. And that includes medical conditions. But that doesn't mean that there is not always hope and that there isn't always something else you can try. And if you feel dismissed by your doctor or if you feel you're not being listened to, then don't blame yourself. It, 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 find another doctor. See someone who does listen, who makes an effort to understand your symptoms, your quality of life, what you're struggling with, and get the help that that you need in a realistic way. And and if one thing doesn't work straight away, try something different and work many with different 
different people with different backgrounds and expertise. So you may, there's nothing wrong with having some counseling to talk about the way you deal with this diagnosis, how it affects you, how it makes you feel like an outsider because no one else has it in your age group. So seek some mental health support, seek physical health support, you know, have a personal trainer to get you get you on on the right path to start with some exercises, simple things you can do if you can afford it. And you know what? YouTube is full of of of, of good quality and, and follow Amanda on Instagram. She shows you how to do the plank. <laughs> 30 seconds a day. <laughs> but start with, with these small things. Seek different if you have to 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 Built on, you know, to find different puzzle pieces to your overall well being. Don't give up and do find people in your life that have your well being at heart that you can share this with, that have a positive influence on the way you feel. If someone does not want to hear a close friend or family member who, who does not want to hear about the way what you're going through, then that's okay. But it's fine if they accept that. But it is important to make positive connections with people, to share it in a meaningful way, because if you bottle it up, if you just worry about it and you have to carry the burden of this diagnosis and the long-term problems that you're facing on your own, it's not something anyone can do. But sharing the problem is halving the problem. And that would be my advice. And find people who have a positive impact on your life, whoever that might be, family, friends, healthcare professionals, Anyone I like, can connect yeah. with. I really like the, you know, don't blame yourself narrative as well, because that's where we go. It's our knee jerk reaction. I'm a failure. I'm doing something wrong. How about you, Hannah? Yeah, so I, I agree with what, what Mandy has said. I think there's a lot of people will sit, turn around and say, think, what have I done? Why, why has this happened to me? And it's it's not, it's nobody's fault. Unfortunately, life is unfair. These things happen. But one of the important things I'd say is that you're not alone. I think I was really struck when I went through my own surgery um, that actually there was quite a lot of people in my position and actually quite a lot of healthcare professionals. I did a teaching session at a local hospital with a gynecologist and I was surprised at the number of women in a small district general hospital in Suffolk in England who actually had a POI or a surgical menopause below the age of 40. There were probably a group, I mean, there were probably most of them were in that room, but there was still there was still about 10 of them. <laughs> and I was so I remember being really quite Ten of them in Suffolk. <laughs> well, but I was still, I was no. a tiny little, you know, t- I was very surprised. So you're not alone. No. There are, you know, fine people who, who've got your best interests at heart. I also like to think of it as a, it, it's hard, but I think you learn as you go through that even the hardest things you learn something from. And I don't mean that to sound trite, but I, I feel in my own way, I think it's given me an opportunity to kind of take control of certain things that I might otherwise not have looked at otherwise. Like, you know, I've, you, you have a chance to think about, you know, protecting your health going forward and make healthier lifestyle decisions and stuff, which is it's kind of empowering. But it also gives you the opportunity to meet people you wouldn't otherwise have done. So there's the days network in the UK which is a charity for women with POI if if like me you ended up having surgery because of endometriosis and a severe premenstrual disorder there's there's the endometriosis UK there's probably a similar in the in the in the US there's the Sermeno connection in the US there's there is IAPMD there's lots of organizations now you will find people who kind of you know trod a similar path to yourself you're not on your own and I think finding people who can relate is going to be really important that's Um, exactly right that that community aspect is I think a little bit of a game changer because of the way that it just feels like the burden has been reduced because like Mandy said a problem shared is a problem half but it really does remove the fear of isolation and I think that's a great place to end and I'm going to make sure that everybody listening knows where to buy your book. I'll make sure that's in the show notes. Please pick it up. It's such a great resource. I want to thank you both for coming on. It was really great to speak to you both today. Such an important topic. And thanks. Take care. Bye for now. Thank you, Amanda. 
Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you like what you hear, then why not subscribe to this podcast and leave me a review? You see, when you do this, it helps to raise the profile of my show and attract new listeners. And it also allows me to continue to deliver valuable content with great guests. And in return for you doing that, I will send you my 12-week core-focused program called Abs on Fire as a thank you. Simply drop me an email at amanda at amandasteve.com and I'll wing that your way. Bye.